Hello, hello, welcome everybody. I'm just gonna give it a couple uh, seconds as people trickle in. Thank you for joining us this afternoon on a Monday. <laughs> it's great to see so many people here. This is excellent. So yeah, I think we can um, get started. Uh, so welcome everybody. My name is Greg Stewart and I'm the coordinator of adult public programs and a museum educator uh, here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, so I'm so happy to welcome you to Beyond Europe, Medieval Art and the World, the Ida G. Discant Memorial Lecture. Before we begin, I wanna say that it's with gratitude and humility that the Philadelphia Museum of Art recognizes Philadelphia as part of the Lenape Hokink the ancestral homelands of Lenape peoples. A long history of broken treaties, forced migrations, and fraudulent agreements such as the walking purchase of 1737 uh, displaced many of Lenape from this land. This museum and our staff strive to understand our place within the legacy of colonization and to act as allies to the Lenape people and their vibrant communities today, including the Delaware tribe, Delaware Nation, and Stockbridge Muncie community. And we pay honor and respect to Lenape ancestors past and present by committing to build a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So today's talk gives us a chance to celebrate an exhibition called uh, Medieval Treasures from the Glencairn Museum, which highlights work from this very important collection here in Philadelphia. And we are just so lucky to be able to steward uh, this while they undergo some, some big renovations. Uh, and it also gives us to celebrate um, Robert and Ida G. Discant, and indeed the entire Discant family, uh, who set up an endowment um, to honor their parents through this lecture series, which focuses on Europe, uh, European art between um, 1100 and 1900. Ida Discant was a highly regarded Sorbonne educated scholar who just did so much um, meaningful work here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, and we're just so grateful to the Discant family for their support and um, for this opportunity today. Um, so it, we're honored to be here with Dr. Risham Majid, whose scholarship uh, expands our knowledge of medieval Europe in so many ways. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear a perspective on the works in the exhibition. Um, but before we do, I just want to give you a sense of how our program will be uh, structured today. So. Um, we're going to have an introduction on the exhibition, and um, we'll hear about Dr. Majid's uh, bio from Jack Hinton, the Henry P. McElhinney Curator of European Decorative Arts and Sculpture. And then Risham will uh, do her presentation, and then we'll have audience Q&A um, at the end. And we expect the program to last about an hour. As a reminder, you're in a Zoom webinar, so your camera and microphones are turned off, but you can ask questions in the Q&A box as they come up. And questions you really like can be upvoted so they rise to the top. Closed captioning is available by clicking on the CC button in the Zoom toolbar. And this program is being recorded and we will send the recording to everyone who has registered. So, so with that, I'm just gonna turn it over to Jack. Thanks, Greg. Thank you so much for uh, uh, having me today. Sorry, I, I can't. I can't see myself, so I'm not. I'm hoping you can all see me. But uh, it's a, it's a great honour to be able to introduce uh, Risham, our speaker today, for the Discant Memorial Lecture. Um, certainly, in connection with our show upstairs in the medieval galleries of the treasures from the Glencairn Museum, which you know, really is is all about uh, connections. You know, making or, or maintaining the at least century old connections that we have between this museum and Glencairn uh, and the Pitcairn family, and also thinking about the, the wonderful objects, the masterpieces in that show and the kinds of connections that uh, Risham uh, can, can tease out for, for us from those objects to a uh, you know, broader, um, more, more global perspectives um, in art and medieval art. So Risham is the associate profession, professor excuse me, sorry, of art, art history and architecture at Ithaca College in New York. 
um, and has a PhD from Columbia University. And Rishan uh, was born in Pakistan and grew up in Saudi Arabia and in London and specializes in medieval art in Western Europe and the historical arts of Africa. Um, and her research investigates the parallel reception of the two fields during the emergence of art history as a discipline um, and also the connection be between the European Middle Ages and historical African art. And her current projects include uh, an examination of sub-Saharan Africa in conversation with Europe during the medieval period, um, and also a re-examination of what the term medieval might mean when we think about other parts uh, of the world. Majid's taught, uh, uh, Risham rather, has taught courses on the history of, of museums, on the political complexities of non-Western arts and Western museums, and medieval art from a global perspective. Um, Risham's curated exhibitions, including uh, Made to Move, African Nomadic Design, and Get Real, Seeking Authenticity in African Art, uh, with her students at Ithaca, and uh, has also written various uh, publications, including a review essay on exhibitions Caravans of Gold and Sahel in the Art Bulletin, um, about Mayor Shapiro and in, in things in the Art Journal. And Rishan's also working on a book length study at the museums of the Trocadero Palace in uh, Paris, um, which uh, will, I'm sure, be absolutely fantastic. So I'm, I'm happy to hand over to Risham with her talk, Beyond Europe, Medieval Art and the World. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jack, for that very comprehensive introduction. Um, and thank you, Greg, for inviting me. And to the both museums, Glen Cairn and the Philadelphia Museum of Art for this great opportunity. So I will just start uh, sharing my PowerPoint. So the title Beyond Europe, um, invites us to think about Europe uh, in a broader context, which is what I plan to do with objects from uh, the collection from Glen Cairn at Philadelphia. And I want to start um, by sort of evoking um, a micro and macro perspective on materials, which is what I'm going to be focusing on. On the left, you have the micro, um, you know, in an abstract kind of form of a very famous object in the National Gallery of Art, uh, that is the Chalice of Abbot Suger from Saint-Denis. And then on the right, you have a NASA perspective on the Atlas Mountains, which is a source of uh, the rock, the sardonyx or onyx, um, you know, with some red veining uh, that these things come from. So in looking at something, you know, in great detail, but also being aware of how it reached um, our eyes, uh, in the Middle Ages, as well as today in the museum, is the main sort of arc of what I'll be showing you. So this is the chalice in situ in the museum on the left. Um, you know, it's given a great sort of pride of place um, and it has this iridescence. It's really a remarkable thing to look at through different kinds of light. But one thing I wanted to point out here is that even in medieval period, we're focusing on materials today, but materials were incredibly important to the patrons and consumers of the objects that we're looking at. Because if we look very closely, um, we see that in this 17th century uh, watercolor, the little sort of foot of the chalice is still available. So it's a complete object. You'll note also that the chalice's bowl, right, is almost a thousand years older than the mounts that we have uh, shown to us on the right. So it's the material of that um, unique object that is kind of celebrated and framed by the gold and the jewels that we see uh, that Abbot Suger had put together. And I couldn't resist giving you one of the most sort of well-known passages from the Middle Ages, that I think also um, amplifies uh, our need to concentrate on materials in a contextual manner. So this is from the abbot himself. Uh, we have, we're lucky that we have a lot of um, extant material. Much of the abbey was destroyed during the French Revolution. Um, and we are, that is the condition in which we witness objects in museums is through previous acts of destruction. So. All of that coming together, let's return to Suger in uh, the early part of the 12th century when he writes, 
when out of my delight in the beauty of the house of God, the loveliness of the many colored gems has called me away from external cares and worthy meditation has induced me to reflect, transferring that which is material to that which is immaterial on the diversity of the sacred virtues. Then it seems to me that I see myself dwelling, as it were, in some strange region of the universe, which neither exists entirely in the slime of the earth, nor entirely in the purity of heaven, and that by the grace of God, I can be transported from this inferior to that higher world in an anagogical manner, end quote. So here he is really making a case for how we can be prompted by things that we see, feel, touch, uh, and sort of elevated, moved into something that transcends that materiality. However, the materiality is uh, essential. These are just other views that I'm showing you. Obscuring the foot here uh, is this new mount made somewhat uh, after the 17th century. And then to also think about collections a little bit. Uh, the collection that we have, the context of this particular object would have been the treasury of Saint-Denis, which is recorded for you on the left uh, from the 18th century. And you see the chalice here uh, in the foreground. And another context is the museum. More context, uh, I suggest, is thinking about land, thinking about uh, history. And so whereas medievalists, we would purely experience uh, the chalice as a liturgical object in the choir of the church to which it belonged. This is the choir of Saint-Denis. Um, we can also hearken back to a landscape that is distant, but also made near through trade routes, which I'll tell you more about in a second. Another thing to keep in mind is that um, the Atlas Mountains in North Africa and North Africa also has a continuous kind of overlapping history of antiquity with uh, Europe as well. And on the left, bottom left, you see the ruins of an Arch of Triumph in Algeria. Moving to our subject of today, keeping in mind materials, roots, and place, we see Glen Cairn, which is also evocative of a, of a medieval um, establishment of some kinds and installs its objects in a way that harkens back to their original use. So you see the interior on the right and on the left is the exterior of the museum. And this is the exhibition that uh, Jack has curated uh, so beautifully in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. If you were to go there, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of what the galleries look like. And there's the sort of star of the show is that little head, which we'll get to in a second. Oops. Also want to give a little sense of history and uh, cultural overlaps that these objects um, evoke for us. So we begin in, in that little gallery, you have all of this history. Um, the late Roman empire until its fall um, and with the St. Peter ivory. We then have a kind of shifting access to the origins of the materials that we're looking at which for the most part in this uh, particular period are coming from Sub-Saharan Africa. And so when you have that shift away from uh, Roman dominance into Islamic uh, dominance, you also see uh, ivory coming in great quantities into the Iberian Peninsula after uh, its conquest by, by Muslims. And then as we move into the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, you have a further opening up of North Africa and trade routes um, uh, by virtue not only of uh, trade, but by also by uh, antagonism. It's also the period of the Crusades. And so interactions in this time period have territory involved, they have ideologies involved, but they also have a kind of mutual interest, which our objects will reveal. 
Um, another thing to keep in mind is the simultaneity of empires in Africa that are also converting and engaging in the, the tr trans, uh, trans-Saharan trade in a, in a very prominent way that we've only recently come to appreciate as a kind of motivating and all kind of inclusive force for the Western European Middle Ages. Um, exhibitions are really key to understanding these things because it's really through exhibitions of late that we've learned about trade routes. Um, there was an exhibition at the Gardner Museum that talked about Simone Martini's access to gold, for example, which I'll return to. But our objects are from Northern Europe and you can see exactly where, uh, Rouen, Autun, um, Northern Spain, as well as saint guillem in Southwestern France. And you see the proximity that you have, you know, through um, the Iberian Peninsula to North Africa. And remembering that in most of our period, control of this area is uh, under Muslim rulers. Another thing to remember, and perhaps reconsider actually, is that Africa has always been a part of a conversation in Europe because the kingdom of Aksum uh, converted to Christianity just about the same time as uh, Constantine um, came to prominence and also later converted to Christianity. And also the very pragmatic nature of conversion. Um, part of converting to a kind of lingua franca is to engage in a common language in order to facilitate um, and attract people to your products, essentially. And so the addition of the cross here in the gold uh, coin, you also see that the gold is now coming from West Africa for Ethiopia, and that the gold in Rome also has connections um, to Sub-Saharan Africa. And so that Roman control that produces ivory and gold in Europe um, is in dialogue with the kingdom of Aksum before it falls in the seventh century. Just to give you a sense of where we are in terms of Aksum, so this is contemporary Ethiopia and the empire of Aksum here has um, access to the tributaries of the Nile all the way up into Eastern, to the Eastern Mediterranean. And you see that the imprint of the Roman empire slowly sort of transforms into a culturally hybrid, uh, what people now refer to as an Islamicate uh, region. Another thing to uh, question is how do we know it's African ivory? It's not coming from India because in Roman times, India was really anything South. But the African elephant is different to the Indian elephant. The tusks of the African elephant that you see here, the savanna elephant that reaches from West Africa to East Africa, they're really monumental. And they're much larger than the tusks of the Asian elephant that you see on the right. And so through measurements and just through sheer uh, proportions, we can, we can uh, with some confidence argue that it is coming through the trans-Saharan networks rather than the roots further east. So some of the most famous objects of this time period um, coming from Spain, from Muslim Spain or Al-Andalus are these uh, little boxes or pixes. And you see the diameter is about the diameter of medium to large sized African elephants. So that's anywhere from 11 centimeters to about 14 centimeters. And on the right, you see a hollowed out tusk itself and the tusk as an object is something that becomes quite quite prominent as we move along uh, in time and start looking at monumental sculpture in Western Europe as well. But this the point being that the, the most sort of splendid ivory is coming through North Africa and the Iberian Peninsula in this period, which is from the ninth century onwards. And that this is not something that's unusual. It's not something completely new. These are threads of continuity with the ancient world. This is perhaps the most famous uh, ivory of the late antique period, the Barberini ivory now at the Louvre. And when we look at, you have the emperor receiving tribute and what kind of tribute does he have? You have a huge tusk here that's being offered to him. And as if to sort of conflate the two, to remind the view of where that comes from are these elephants. And so 
giving um, giving ivory as a tribute. It's a luxury item. It's an item of power. It always connotes um, a sense of esteem and elevation. And so St. Peter here on the right is um, made of African ivory. And some have suggested that this unusual motif behind him, this conch-like format, matches another ivory at the Louvre, which I'm sorry, I don't have a photo of for you, um, and was perhaps produced in North Africa um, in the fifth or sixth century, although at the moment it is listed as Rome or Ravenna. Um, I'm showing you now a map of trade networks that indicates the Sahara, but doesn't use it as a barrier, it uses it as a way of connecting the gold fields that are down here and the, what we now know as the Ivory Coast to uh, through the Straits of Gibraltar all into the Iberian Peninsula and the great extent of the Islamic network um, that moves simultaneously east and west. Um, shrinks gradually in the medieval period in Spain, but is certainly a very sort of prominent player in, um, in trade networks. So the map I'm showing you here again is really thanks to Caravans of Gold, which was curated by Kathleen um, Birdsock. And so again, to really emphasize the role of new research that's coming from recent exhibitions is really animating a lot of new thinking about objects we're so familiar with. In the another Pixis from the same time period, you see that the elephant is featured with the tusk on its own tusk. So there's a kind of double representation there that you are giving importance and prominence to the person who uh, to whom this belonged, for whom it was made, but also to the animal itself. There is a kind of reverence for a creature that is um, sort of monumental in a way, I think perhaps the largest an a land animal there is, and also witnessing. Maybe uh, there is also an element of having seen an elephant and people are moving in this time period, not sort of necessarily staying in one place as trade necessitates movement both north and south and east and west. In other ways, uh, the elephant takes on symbolic forms. Uh, and what we have here are images that a friend and colleague sent on her trip from Italy just recently. And you have these uh, elephants uh, prominently shown on a throne, supporting a throne. And this harkens back to um, the fact that there's an interchangeability between an, the idea of an elephant and its ivory. So when we think a little bit about symbolic value, we can think a little bit about uh, Glen Cairn as well. There are the two seats for Mr. and Mrs. Pitt Cairn, the U and uh, the U and the Ram, very appropriate for Aries season. Very sweet, symbolizing the family. Just a little sort of connection there, but our main object for this point is the casket in the exhibition, which is made out of ivory as well, and takes uh, its themes from the Book of Kings, from the throne of Solomon. And so you see here the judgment of Solomon, um, where uh, he's seated on a throne. Let me get you a, a close up, where he's uh, seated on this throne. Um, and you know, deciding which which mother is is the real mother. We all know that story. However, the thing of itself is made out of ivory, and he's seated on a throne with his uh, legs and feet elevated off the ground. And you know, king's feet don't touch the ground, so it is literally made out of ivory. The throne on which he's sitting, because of the material of the entire box, but it also takes us back to the Book of Kings, which describes the throne of Solomon as being made out of ivory as well. Uh, from the Book of Kings, a great throne of ivory and overlaid with the finest gold. It had six steps, and the top of the throne was round behind. And there were two hands on either side holding the seat, and the two lines stood one at each hand. So we don't uh, we don't have an evocation of that, but the but the physical manufacture of the throne in the narrative here harkens back to an older text. And as we move into ivory itself and its representation as tusks. We get into um, San Lazar, which is where the little head of the king from Glencairn is from. 
And here, it's not always the case that you will see the trumpets of the Last Judgment um, as huge ivory tusks as you see at Otun, um, as I'll show you in other examples. Here, however, this is the tympanum of San Lazar in Otun, and it shows the Last Judgment. And I'm giving you the details of these ivory horns that are up here with the little angels and the round of the tympanum. And our head, here to give you a sort of a close up of that, of a hollowed out tusk, and then a contemporary example. This is actually at the Louvre and that the sort of decorate, the decoration is very similar um, to the tusk that is shown in The Last Judgment. This is the sort of announcement of the end of time. It has uh, echoes of prestige and terror um, that we'll get into in a second. The head, we believe comes from this now empty archivolt that might have had the elders of the apocalypse um, that are described in the vision of St. John. Um, not quite sure, but it is a king. And knowing other examples from this time period that show kings, uh, or rather the elders as kings, we can take a look in a second at the close up here. Also, not only are we locating this object in its own time, that is, you know, as it was made in the 12th century, it itself is evoking a future, right? The second coming of Christ. And then if we look at it very closely, it has a crown, but the crowns at Otan are, 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 are varied. And in this particular example, what you have is a very prominent repetition of a Roman arch uh, going all the way, would have been going all the way around the crown. And we have to remember again, the Roman, uh, presence in Otan, very similar to what I was describing in North Africa, you have visual remnants, palimpsests of um, other cultures, other um, motifs that are used, appropriated to um, advocate for the present as a kind of equivalent of the past, perhaps even surpassing the past. And so these are examples of details from the tympanum, excuse me, that I just showed you, the details of these arches that I'm showing you is from, this is the foot, the feet of Christ and an arcade that runs across it. Above in a separate section, you have the fluted pilasters with foliate, um, foliate capitals. And this is from the Roman gate in Otan, that's the Port Daru, I'm giving you some details of that. So this was clearly the place of uh, visual appropriation that we see throughout Otan, and it is a way of authenticating the present um, as much as it is also arguing for the validity of um, the validity and the sort of authority of the place in which we stand has this connection to a distant thousand year old past. And just another example of some Roman ruins around Otan, this is the Temple of Janus. Um, and this gets us to another object in the exhibition, which is from a place called saint Guillaume le Désert. And here I want to uh, emphasize through form that these, both these religions, Christianity and Islam, are very actively engaged with the Roman past that is readily available to them in proximity to the places in which these objects were created. So the foliate capital that you see on the top left is from saint Guillaume, and it's in the exhibition. It's a foliate capital that is very much based on um, the Corinthian capital of Roman architecture, but it varies it. Uh, there are insertions of humans, there are insertions of demons, there are uh, sort of motifs that activate the foliage as if it is sort of lived. In the Muslim examples, you have inscriptions, sometimes that describe the architect. Um, and so it's a way of updating an older form and making it your own, but it is a common kind of heritage that they have. Another example would be um, the palace of Medina al Zahra, which is outside of Cordoba, which prominently uses these uh, Corinthian capitals. Some of them are actually reused Roman capitals. 
um, at the time because you do have recent ex excavations that show us really splendid monumental uh, Roman architecture in Cordoba. <clears throat> Now, returning to the kind of reasoning uh, around the crown and what that figure from Otun might have participated in had we all of the context that we wanted, I'm showing you an, a little bit of an earlier monument, which is uh, the second coming of Christ from Saint-Pierre and Moissac in uh, southwestern France. And this is now a second coming. So it's the vision of St. John. It's not a last judgment but it does show the elders of the apocalypse described in the Bible. And here's the detail of them. And even here, we get to see the sort of all of the known finery um, of this time of the 12th century that is given to the future in a way. So everything that is refined, the new technologies of textiles that we can see, in these embroideries and different weights of garments that these figures are wearing. Um, and it's shown as a kind of court culture and court cultures in Southwestern France here draw heavily on court cultures nearby in Southern Spain in Islamic court uh, cultures. And this kind of border, this heavily embroidered border uh, is something that um, harkens to garments, uh, fragments of garments that are honorific, that are known as theras, which I'm showing you in the center there. And they are, um, they, are they give you a kind of summary of uh, flattery for the person to whom they are bestowed upon. And so these circulate in the Mediterranean and have been used for various purposes in, um, in France and in Spain. And so again, what I mentioned, even though this is a period of the Crusades, the first crusade is uh, 1095 and Jerusalem captured in 1099, there is still an interest that accompanies aggression that is not necessarily one or the other. And the incorporation of these motifs as honorific into the sculpture is an indication of that. Here is another example. How, how these textiles might have been used to wrap relics. And this is a reliquary. Well, it's a priest holding a reliquary um, that is at the Met Cloisters. It's actually at an exhibition uh, at, at Holy Cross right now on the Crusades. And so these um, textiles were highly valued in many, many different contexts. As we move in, you'll see as the crusading period extends um, and you have the second crusade, as well, you'll see the much more prominent indication of uh, pseudo-Arabic script is what we have come to call it on the garments properly placed here of the Virgin Mary holding uh, Christ. This is a throne of wisdom that relates back to the throne of Solomon um, in a second. And when we look at later monuments, this is the kind of twin uh, church for Otun. This is Vesele. And this shows the mission to the apostles where they're given the task to convert all of the world. And one of the coffers here shows us Muslims in various attire. Of course, in Islamic cultures all you know, through a vast region, not everyone dressed alike, but you do have curious kinds of a turban and then all of them are wearing these platform heels, which my students always find really fascinating as heels. But, is they are uh, documented as the kinds of shoes that are worn in the East. I don't have an example from this time period, but this is one from the 18th century in the Shoe Museum in Toronto that shows you platforms that were, that were worn to sort of keep your feet off the ground. Um, and again, an, interest, uh, an intense interest in detail of things that are different is accompanies a greater sort of involvement with other places. Um, and we see that with the famous camel from the Met Cloisters, which is also from Northern Spain. And again, when we see an animal like this, it has its characteristic features, but it's not a caricature. Um, it, it has the, the sort of 
bend and and the kind of uh, gait of the camel is understood here. So again, a suggestion that observable uh, animals, not native to Spain, of course, but uh, that there is a kind of circulation of people that might have had exposure to things that people who were sedentary didn't. And so in the process of conversion, again, what we have is, you know, we're keeping lots of moving pieces here, but since we've moved into the 12th and 13th centuries, this is also the point where West African kings uh, convert to Islam. And the conversion to Islam is incredibly important here because it is one to elevate status with Muslim traders who are coming from North Africa to, uh, to the empire of Mali. Um, this is the great mosque of Jene, which was initially built in the 13th century, but has been destroyed and rebuilt over long periods of time and is a marker and indicator of the conversion of, of uh, King Khoi Conboro at that time. But again, conversions are alliances um, as much as they are expressions of devotion is the larger point I wanted to make there. And so the most famous example we have um, of Sub-Saharan Africa is this. It is used in practically every exhibition and it is a map of sorts that comes to us from the early part of the 14th century. And what it shows us is um, a man who's veiled on a camel. This person probably actually never saw a camel, uh, ironically, who is greeting a king. Uh, Mansa Musa was the king who famously took a pilgrimage across Africa and broke the bank literally because of the amount of gold that he carried with him. And he is shown holding um, an orb of gold, uh, which is what this region is then known for. But this figure is also very important to us. When we look at uh, the stained glass that we have in the exhibition, there are indications of gold that are used not literally as representations or made out of gold, but evocative of gold as a material. And so the Rouen window here, which very prominently um, silhouettes and creates a space for the exchange of the gold coins here, um, gives us a sense of um, the materiality of, of the gold coin itself. And usually when we look at stained glass, we can talk about color, we can talk about um, iconography, we can talk about typology, but we can also now think about what did that gold coin mean for a viewer in the 13th century who might have been aware of, uh, of where it was coming from. And the reason why Muslims and nomads become so important is that Berbers have um, Tuareg today, but nomadic Berber populations have been in North Africa for thousands of years. And from this time period, one of the most famous travelers to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa came himself from Tunis and was Berber himself was Ibn Battuta, who I'm sure some of you have heard of. And when we look at this figure and its prominence in that map, this is a contemporary Tuareg uh, person on his camel, you see a couple of similarities. One is um, camels are not ridden like horses. You are sort of squatting on it. And so you see there are no stirrups. There's some awareness of how a, a camel is ridden, but more importantly, I would like to read to you a passage from Ibn Battuta who says, and the caravans are what, you know, remember the exhibition title, caravans of gold, caravans are what facilitate access to product. The caravan cannot travel except under their protection. And amongst them, the protection of a woman is more important than that of a man. They are nomads. They do not stay in one place. And then he goes on to talk about their women because it's a matrilineal society. Uh, and the women control the most important part of nomadic culture, which is the tent. Their women are the most perfect of women in beauty and the most comely in figure, in addition to being pure, white, and fat, end quote. So it really is through this kind of um, sort of translation of control. We have the mines that are down here and the gold fields that are down here, but the trade is, is 
the person that somebody in Europe would have had access to would have been a Muslim trader, wouldn't have been somebody coming from Sub-Saharan Africa all the way up here. There are various stages uh, in which you experience it. And so there are connotations of Muslim uh, sort of finery that has to do with this gold trade, even though it is coming from Sub-Saharan Africa. And when we look um, in the most sort of uh, explosive kind of nature of gold in uh, medieval painting, which was used to be called the international style, you see that there is a much more, an equally prominent inclusion of the theras that I mentioned before around the hem of the garment of the Virgin Mary. This is a famous uh, Maesta by Duccio and the pseudo Arabic that runs around it. The gold that is coming in greater quantities now and is being tooled to give it a almost a sculptural presence on a flat background. Um, as if there's more of it than there actually is, because these are really thin sheets that are that are pounded out. So again, materials that are coming from distant places that have the most value um, in terms of trade and in terms of just general sort of thinking are directed towards the most important people in Christianity. So you have a kind of cumulative effect of gold, um, of theras. And finally, also of ivory. So the Solomonic throne, um, you know, the wisdom of Solomon that is transferred to Christ through his mother, all of that is, is evoked in the sculpture, in the wooden sculpture. She has the theras, she has the blue. Blue is lapis that comes from Afghanistan. And then the ivory virgins that are so famous in this time period. Again, it's not just the material, but it's as if the newer, the, the most sort of available sumptuous materials are kind of embedded into these characters to keep them up to date uh, in terms of their not, of course, not only in terms of their importance, but through what the known world has uh, to offer. Thank you. Thank you, Risham. <laughs> um, so we can move on into the Q&A portion. Um, and I know that Jack maybe has a question or two uh, to start us off. And then um, I think there's already a, a nice question in the in the Q&A. But if um, folks want to think about their questions that they might have and, and start putting in, in the Q&A, that would be great. But I think we'll we'll kick things off with Jack. Thanks so much, Greg. And thanks, Risham. I really, I really enjoyed your talk. And I'm sure um, I want, I'm sure everyone here did uh, as well. So thank you so much. Um, I loved how your talk, you know, was was working with fragments and details to evoke connections between worlds. Um, and I think it, it did it really, really wonderfully. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about this. I'm sorry, I'm realizing I'm selfishly hogging you and everyone else has questions. But do you think, or I'm interested to hear from you, I suppose, about how, you know, that could be imposed um, on the museum and, and on galleries? And, and do you think in a way, you know, it speaks to perhaps looking at things in a less linear fashion than we currently do or that we currently present? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, of course, museums are also sometimes, uh, I mean, I'm telling you, you have departments, you know, and you have to sort of make connections across departments to do an exhibition like this. But I, but I hope that's the way it's going. Where if you wanted to really create a network, a visual network for an audience that moved beyond just the object to draw from various departments, that could be, you know, a model for for looking anew at the materials that you have. Thank you. I can't see the questions, Greg. Can you? Um... Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm happy to um, kind of start to read some of these questions here. Um, so we have a, we have a couple questions on. I think, Risham, you piqued some interests around the idea in in one of your captions of of a once known um, maker, and I'm I, I think people are curious about that. Um, I know that. Kathy Foster, one of our curators here, is, is can you comment on the distinction between unrecorded and once known? 
weren't all these makers once known in a small circle? <laughs> yeah, so actually, you know, I have always used uh, unrecorded because it, you know, it isn't, we just don't know. But it's the kind of, I saw in an exhibition recently that instead of unrecorded, they said once known. And so I kind of used it here and there just to be sort of evocative actually. And what, uh, you know, what that connotes is once known, um, gives us an inkling into knowledge, right? And knowledge production and unrecorded is a little dry. So once known is a little bit more poetic and brings a person in uh, and memory in rather than uh, a fact. So I tend to favor that, but I'm open to hearing other people's ideas. And I think just following up on that, we have a question that's that's generally a sort of, even if we can't name some of these artists, um, you know, because we, we don't have that information, you know, what, what are the sorts of things that we might know about some of these artisans and, and, and um, you know, is, is there any evidence of that that we have too? Oh, sure. I'm sure there is a, there is a question around attribution <laughs> with the Oton head. Um, well, we know quite a bit about medieval production. We have treatises, um, the Theophilus treatise from the 12th century that tells us about handling materials and how to do that. There are inscriptions much more in Italian uh, medieval works that assign it to a particular master uh, or stonemason. In the case of Otun, um, there are various, um, how shall I put it, theories as to what Gislibertus meant um, as that inscription on the tympanum as a patron, which is much more common for us to know patrons in the Middle Ages than to celebrate actual artists as individuals. So it's a, it's a complex thing, but I think if we were to acknowledge that there was a person involved whose hand made this in a museum label, that helps us in bringing that object a little closer to the present, whether that's by name, if we have a name, or just sort of indicating that we know, you know, somebody made this. Thank you. Um, we have some questions about uh, some of the, the costume, the clothing. Um, I think you touched the, a little bit on this in terms of the function of the platform shoes and kind of elevating above the ground. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think just a general question about clothing and, um, you know, a, again, the, the, the hemlines and, and sort of deriving from these Arabic models, if you have um, kind of other thoughts about that kind of form and function a little bit with some of these garments that we looked at. There's uh, lately, there has been a lot of work done on the impact of learning new technologies of textile manufacture from North Africa and coming in from the Holy Land that we see in the mid 12th century monumental figures, for example, at Shark Cathedral. So um, that's that's something that has been traced. Now, with regard to those shoes at Vesele, sure they are they are obviously something that was worn because it's a leather booty on a platform, you know, that sort of keeps your shoe clean in some ways. Um, and also I would, can I, sh can I pull up something else? It ha it, it's, it's not always fair to pull out details from such a huge complex like Vesele, for example. So I would just also make this quick point which I hope I can do. Give me one second. Okay, can you, can I share my screen now? You should be able to. Um, yeah, we didn't change up. Okay, so there this is the complete tympanum and its coffers, this is what I showed you. And it is also a kind of indictment because what you see next to this very fey kind of refined, uh, you know, sort of grouping is the very prominent barefoot apostles, you know, down to the ground, you know, much more sort of connected, humble. So there is a kind of implicit critique in there as well. 
um, of, of as much as there is like real accurate detail, it is um, of course a commentary within a commentary again. Thank you. Um, just kind of looking at some of the other questions here. Um, oh, here's here's one uh, in terms of um, thinking about uh, these cr Christian religious objects made from materials in the Islam Islamic world and um, uh, evidence of of resistance to that or or tension within that kind of material circumstance and their use maybe is one question we can draw from that. So I'm sorry, the, is the question is? Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just read it to you here. Is there any evidence of resistance for uh, Christian religious objects made from materials from the Islamic world? Hmm. I, I don't know how we would uh, have evidence for that. I suppose it just wouldn't be made if there was resistance <laughs> making it. Well, but yeah, I mean, I think that's an important point to make is that, you know, that this is, um, you know, clearly about trade and, and economics and, 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 and goods that people are demanding. So that sort of supply and demand, I suppose you can say that we have in this time period. Um, and, and then this is maybe, maybe just, I, I, I think there's a lot of interest around um, what we might know about the people who would have made some of these objects, which are, um, you know, thinking about important ivory carving centers in in North Africa and, um, you know, in in this period, um, and maybe also kind of where some of these maps that you are showing um, has have been made. Uh, the map, the medieval maps. Yeah. Um, the medieval maps. Uh is attributed to Abraham Kresk, who is Majorcan, and this mm. is a kind of center of map making in the 14th century. The maps that I showed you that, that give us an archeological route, essentially, that's how they're verified from um, between Siena, for example, and North Africa. Those were based on uh, recent archeology span that, um, that some museums have put together. So that's where I got that from. But in terms of centers of carving, et cetera, you know, Cordoba is one at the at the sort of height of the Islamic period there, as we know with these with these um, these pixies. Um, ivory carving Paris becomes very important in the 12th and 13th centuries. And there are workshops that are known for particular types of ivory carving, like, for example, uh, around the circle of Louis the Ninth and the Saint Chapelle, which is really a little bit later than what I'm totally familiar with. But of course, Sarah Garin's work um, can tell you a lot more about that in terms of where and how it was made. What's interesting is that there there isn't a lot of material telling us how ivory was worked. There's obviously evidence that there's some kind of training that goes on that you wouldn't give a tusk to just anyone, you know, that's really rare. Um, but as with a lot of the Middle Ages, our documentation is coming from the objects themselves. So I think more study would help with that regard. Um, this is maybe more a question for Jack. Uh, so will the objects be returned to Glen Karen? Yes, they will. Um, but I wonder if you could just kind of talk a little bit about the arc of the exhibition and, and um, you know, kind of how that process has been and 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 even just some kind of like details about about our exhibition and, and the dates, if you have them, Jack. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I, I do kind of. I mean, I know, I know that our friends from Glen Cairn have joined us today. And of course, we're always deeply grateful to them for their support and for lending us their treasures. Um, and, and I would like to keep them forever, but but they will go back. Um, and that I, we're, we're just working out now, you know, exactly when and how things go back. So um, I would say probably mostly until the end of the year, you can see most of the pieces um, on view here at the museum. A couple might go back earlier and we're just in the process of, of figuring that out. But um, in any case, you know, it's been it's been it's a privilege to have them here and to be able to see them. And also I'd say 
and I, I think my friends from Glencairn would agree that it that it's also interesting because you know you you see them differently here than you would at Glencairn. So, for example, the the relationship between the pieces from Rouen um, and the piece from Saint Denis uh, seen together rather than in separate rooms, for example, or the juxtapositions between the ivory and the and the Gisbertus head. So, you know, I would say why not both? You know, see them here, enjoy them here, and then when Glencairn's reopened in uh, the end of this year and in twenty twenty four. Uh, go and see them there as well um and you know let's continue to to make uh connections and, and and good good partnerships nice and jack thank you that's a great pitch for the exhibition and for glenn karen <laughs> so that's i love it um and and actually this I, i'll say we have so many great questions um and and so little time unfortunately but i there's one maybe that i think would be nice to 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 end on here today and that's um kind of a personal question which is among the artifacts in the exhibition that you didn't cover today, um, Risham, is there one that particularly strikes you? That I didn't cover today. Um... Or maybe we can just open up the conversation and say, yeah, I think the same what glass strikes you <laughs> from the exhibition? The same glass? I think a lot of a lot of the mentions that we have, a lot of the material in this particular collection has a very distinct relationship to the Holy Land and sort of Old Testament ideas. Uh, I don't think we say Old Testament anymore. What do we say? The Hebrew Bible. And um, it's interesting to me what the collector might have been thinking about then, because historically speaking, in terms of interpretive activity, when we see mentions of the East, you know, we always sort of assume it's relating to the older uh, part of the Bible. But I think in the light of this new research on trade networks and contact, that we can be a bit more specific and get even more sort of granular about what these references mean. For example, Salome, I'm really curious as to, I would love to do more work on that Salome um, panel. And just, just to sort of, um, you know, to get less uh, symbolic about what we're looking at. You know, I think there's a real sort of materiality makes us more precise in some ways. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, and there's just lots of kudos coming through the chat. Um, I just wanted to kind of wrap up and just say a, a few words before we go. Um, and let me just share my screen here again. Um, so yeah, we just wanted to say a, a big thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you to Risham. Thank you to Jack. Um, thank you to our captioner, Abby. Um, and thank you to Steve Kiever, who does a lot of the behind the scenes AV work. Um, and of course, huge thanks to the Discant fa uh, family for graciously supporting the lecture. Um, and, and of course, a thanks to all of you who are coming out. Um, just by showing up today on Zoom, you're supporting the museum, and we're so grateful for your presence. Um, we wanted to give an extra thanks to anyone who might have donated um, to the, today's program, which allows us to keep offering great programming like this. Um, and, and also thanks to our members um, for, for supporting us in that way too. And, and a big thanks to the Glencairn Museum and, and everyone here who's, who's um, coming through that way. Um, I will say that our next talk um, will be on May 25th, and we're going to be talking about photography and the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the um, Arnold Newman lecture. So we hope to see you there, and we hope that you can get a chance to come to the museum and see this uh, spectacular exhibition. Um, so yeah, thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Really, really lovely. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.